What is the most painful way to offend and humiliate a man? Deny him the right to be called a breadwinner and a defender. This right was granted to us by nature itself from the birth of humanity. At least, it's what we men think to flatter ourselves. Although most of us, the generation of the 21st century, have never really risked its lives for the sake of others. But somewhere deep inside, we're reassuring ourselves that some kind of a self-enraged hero. If there was a war, then I would accomplish some incredible feat. And what is most interesting, this feature is inherent in the DNA of many men. The notions of sacrifice and readiness to undertake some heroic deeds were manifested in young Ukrainian soldiers fighting at the front line of the hybrid war with Russia. I personally was a volunteer during the war in 2014, and I saw fierce combat with my own eyes. I saw men who have never been in such situations, and suddenly they manifested and revealed their military backbone, and also their willingness to defend their native land, or at least die trying to do so. In the Warfare series, we will talk about the way of the warrior, the military art, the war for freedom, and the basic instincts of ordinary survival. Strangely enough, men were not always breadwinners and warriors. At the dawn of civilization, women ruled in society and in the family. There were no wars and no warriors. It was truly the golden age of humanity. At least some researchers of those ancient times are firmly convinced of this fact. It has long been known that in Tripillian society, men did not play a very significant social role due to the fact that agriculture was mostly dependent on women. Hunting and fishing most likely played only a supporting role. If this was indeed the case, then it can be said that it was a matriarchal society in which there were no wars and there were no warriors. However, according to another group of scientists, humanity embarked on its path to civilization from an almost animal state, where there was a war of all against all. All people were conditionally equal and were not limited by any laws. As the age-old adage goes, might makes right. The lower the degree of development of mankind, the greater was aggression and militancy. People were more active in military conflict because were faced with the task of survival of the fittest. It was difficult to provide for oneself, and for this reason, by killing other humans, you guaranteed yourself a semblance of survival. Only the establishment of the so-called social contract allowed for restraining the wild and belligerent human nature within the limits of civilization, or at least some measure of human decency. But this became possible only with the advent of the state. And this, by the way, became possible precisely thanks to the separation of professional soldiers from society, that is, physically strong and belligerent people who forced the majority of people in society to live by their rules. However, the supporters of the theory of the Golden Age argue that, at least in the heyday of the Tripillian culture, and this was way back in 6 to 3 BC, there were enough resources for everyone to survive, so nobody really had to be forced to the subordination to the stronger. Judging by the nature of the archaeological finds from the times of the Tropillian culture, there was truly the era that archaeologists called the Golden Age in the history of mankind. At least, this was the case on the territory of Ukraine. Wars, as a rule, arise in conditions of limited resources. Obviously, in those times when agriculture was flourishing, in particular farming, there was enough food for everyone. Therefore, there were no wars. The Neolithic archaeological culture of Kukuteni originated on the territory of Romania and spread across the lands of Moldova to the territory of Ukraine, where it assumed that name Tripillian culture. This culture reached its highest peak in the 6th to 3rd millennium BC. Tripillians were farmers on the very fertile black soil belt of Ukraine. They sowed wheat, rye, barley, millet and pea. Most of the agricultural work was done by women who also tended to the livestock. Meanwhile, men hunted and fished. Rich harvests led to the rapid growth of the population. Due to this, proto-cities began to appear all throughout the land. In some of these cities, the population was as high as 15,000. Trepillion did not become attached to their houses. When the land around the settlement stopped cropping, the Trepillions burned their city and moved to new, fresh lands. The exhaustion of the soil gradually led to the decline of the Kukuteni Trepillion culture. 
then the regressing culture became the victim of brutal attacks by warlike nomadic tribes. There is archaeological evidence that some Trapillian proto-cities were besieged. That is, there were already battles with the application of certain military tactics. And when archaeologists requested forensic experts to study the remains of the Trapillian people and culture, it turned out that among the male population death due to their ravaging hostilities was a habitual and almost constant phenomenon. As a matter of fact, the very discussion about whether the Trapillians waged wars or not arose for two simple reasons. Firstly, it is believed that the farmers are peaceful and unwarlike people. They were not known to launch aggressive military campaigns and were only capable and geared towards protecting their land from raids of looters. And second, very few weapons were actually found in the settlements of the Trapillian people. Most contemporary historians deny the existence of such a period in the history of Ukraine, when there were no wars and no conflicts. The notion of the golden age of mankind is based on two main theses. The first is the works of ancient philosophers and chroniclers. The second is that modern-day archaeologists have practically not found any weapons in archaic layers of the land. However, if scientists cannot find objects that could be considered an instrument of murder, this does not mean that people in primitive ages did not kill each other with objects that were used in everyday life, such as knives, stone axes, and bows and arrow. With the help of the latter, hunters could shoot and kill a boar or even an enemy from the neighboring tribe. It is worth recalling that it was not always hunger that provoked people to kill. Quite often, men asserted themselves in this way, thus seeking respect or even fame among their fellow tribesmen. Збирання скальпів своїх повержених ворогів і the collection of the scalps of their enemies was commonplace among the Scythian warriors. These scalps were threaded onto a rope, and each warrior carried them wherever they roamed. If one of the warriors had too many scalps, then they were placed on poles, and there were even, so to speak, orderlies who carried war trophies for respected warriors. I deduced that these scalp trophies were the first decorations of war combat. The difference between them and the present-day combat decorations, of course, is great because those decorations were taken in battle. Scientists still observe such bloody rituals in the tribes of the Amazon River in the Brazilian jungle, which are still at the Stone Age level of development. They do not just kill their enemies, but they are also known for cannibalism, for example. Take note that they do this not from hunger, but by virtue of the accepted customs. Indeed, having eaten the heart of the murdered enemy, one can gain their strength, or at least so they believe. First evidence of the warriors' valor was simple and pragmatic. They cut off head of the enemy. There is a hypothesis that they were even making tattoos using war paint and the like. In addition, there is such a hypothesis that among the Scythian professional soldiers, there were certain groups of people who got high before battle. Indeed, they sat in their special tents and inhaled the vapors of narcotic substances to get into a state of mind for battle action. And they did not even use armor. They stripped to the waist and cut themselves with swords in order to further get enraged from the blood before going into battle. Trapillians were also surrounded by wild and warlike tribes. In the north, fairly primitive tribes of foragers lived in the forests, and in the eastern and southern steppes, nomad cattle breeders had already appeared. The latter, among other things, already lived in patriotic caste, in which the tribe was headed by a man, a warrior leader. Both the steppe and woodland residents frequently went on raids of the border settlements of the Trapillians, though they did not risk going deep into the Pillian territory. 
Trapillians demographically dominated over all their neighbors, both those who lived in the forest and the steppes. All they had to do was skillfully exploit these masses of people to heavily concentrate them in the settlements. Each such settlement could mount a detachment of close to a thousand soldiers. At that time, it was a very large, powerful and practically invincible military force, with which neither the forest dweller nor the tribes living in the steppe could compete. That is, no one dared to attack the Trapillians because of their massive numbers. There were only border skirmishes, during which enemy forces quickly looted the outermost settlement and just as quickly fled for safety with the looted goods. This was the main tactic of the nomads. However, most of the Trapillian warriors perished in internecine clashes between the tribes of the Trapillians. Firstly, the main enemies were the Trapillians themselves, and the main armed conflicts took place in inter-tribal wars between the Trapillians. Secondly, the wars between the Trapillians and their Slavic relatives, who were farmers' agricultural crops from the southwest, to be sure from the Balkan Peninsula. That is a large farming area that experienced its own demographic explosion, also existed on this peninsula in those times. The battle for land is a trivial and prosaic reason for wars. It completely depreciates the natural aggressiveness and warlike character of men and their desire to protect their land and people and show the enemy some semblance of noble behavior. It is more pleasant for the stronger side of humanity to think that wars exist because men just want to gain power and seek glory. However, everything has its own objective reason, and the reason for wars is the struggle for resources. Although in this struggle there has always been a place for the noble behavior of male warrior soldiers. At a time when there were no major wars, but there were some conflicts of interest in hunting or in some specific spheres, two groups came together and the older ones of the groups came out for a duel. And it did not even always end with the murder of the defeated. The fact is that the opponent could win the duel and then very generously spare the defeated rival. The personal fights between heroes were quite common in our later history. For example, the duel between the Tmutarakan prince Mstislav the Brave and the leader of the Kasogians, Rededia. The Ruthenian hero was victorious and bloodshed was avoided. The Kasogians accepted their defeat, surrendered to the mercy of the Ruthenians, and even paid tithes to the victory for many long years afterwards. In the historical period, when people lived in clans and all the men in the tribe were warriors, all public affairs were handled collectively. Each man had the right to one vote and decisions about the life of the community were made by all the peers. Contemporary scholars call this time the period of military democracy. Be that as it may, over time the strong warriors gradually rose above their tribesmen, became influential and members of the nobility. Indeed, they became the main basis for the retinue, the professional army and the support of their ruler in all of his stately affair. Military democracy disappears when a certain hierarchy develops in society. That is, when the top is crystallized, these are people who have repeatedly shown their talent and their ability to take command of the army. Under the guidance of such individuals, other leaders were raised, and they could take responsibility at once by passing those complications that were more often than not associated with the procedures of military democracy. На себе відразу взяти відповідальність без цих всяких ускладнень, які пов'язані з демократією. The more the tribe fought, the faster it formed the military hierarchy, headed by the leader. People's communities, which were literally warrior people, lived on the territory of Ukraine in different periods. In particular, this is precisely how modern-day historians describe the Sarmatians. In general, the most belligerent peoples were quite often nomadic, and they indeed left their indelibles on the history of Ukraine and our army. On the territory of Ukraine, military conflicts were also caused by the fact that we had two opposing worlds, a settled north and a barren land of nomads, which were situated in the south. But the problem was that both of them, at some point in history, laid claim to the exact same territory. 
were the first to appear on our territory except, of course, the Black Sea Greeks, were the great Sumerian people. Subsequently, the Sarmatians conquered and assimilated them, as well as the Scythians that had come after them. And the latter then bit the dust of history, thanks to new nomads on horseback known as the Huns. They also initiated a massive migration of peoples, which turned the steps south of Ukraine into a bona fide transit artery, through which dozens of different peoples passed. Of course, it would not be advisable to call the Scythians the ancestors of Slavs, because most researchers tend to believe that this was an Iranian-speaking group of people, that is, they were not part of an ancient Slavic population, but the Slavs, directly inheriting this territory, adopted the best Scythian practices available. For example, the well-known guerrilla tactics were used successfully by Cossack troops, as well as the warriors of the Ukrainian insurgent army, or the UPA, which is the accepted acronym in history books. Our ancestors, the early Slavs, watched from the underbrush of Polysia how nations were born and perished in the Black Sea steppes. They had no power and no desire to fight for the steppe lands, but they learned from their enemies, and they learned the art of war, among other things. Therefore, when the early Slavs appeared on the historical arena, they fully corresponded to the aforementioned principle. They were wild, warlike, and hungry. They adopted the cult of the warrior from the Scythians. Scythian society was completely militarized. All Scythian customs are associated with war. And worshipping the sword is an ancient Scythian tradition. Most likely there were also corresponding sacrifices. This sword was washed with the blood of enemies and was also used to cut off the heads of the enemies and all of the attributes that go with it. Зокрема, вот цей меч поливався кров'ю, і мали місце і відрізані голови ворогів, і вся така прихистория times were truly bloody. Sometimes entire nations disappeared from the world arena after the extermination at the hands of some conqueror. And the passage from the primary chronicle that perished like the Avars is there for good reason. However, we should never forget that bloody words were also the engine of progress. After all, they facilitated the development of societies of those times. So remember, every phenomenon has its pros and cons, its pro and contra.